the Kushi Sha. She, uh, she are going to present a multimedia presentation for us with a video. It will be uh, our beginning of this session of today. And uh, so I'd like to introduce Kushi. Uh, Kushi Sha. She has completed her Bachelor in Construction Technology from CEPT University, India, in May 2021. She's an heritage enthusiast and queen researcher. She's the founder of Indian Heritage, a social media website and account that aims to promote the rich and diverse heritage of India. She's also the recipient of Martin Weaver Research Scholarship, powered by Association of Preservation Technology for her research on conservation of full house of Ahmedabad. She's an active member of Ecomos India and has undertaken the review as an independent expert identifying through Ecomos Network for the World Monuments Watch 2022 nomination. So I will start sharing the video of Kushisha. Uh, it's called the Sitting Conflict. And then I will open the floor for Kushi to talk a little bit more with us. I don't hear the sound in the video. Oh, no, I'm sorry. Let me share it now. Thank you for saying to me. Conflict is integral to life, but how the society manages conflicts reveals how mature it is. Total absence of conflict may also not indicate an ideal society. To strengthen our humanity, it is important to introspect publicly. It is essential to celebrate the plurality and encourage conflicting expression in artistic and creative ways. I am brought up in Ahmedabad, a city in Gujarat, India. To say that the history of the city is complex would be an understatement. It is believed that the city was established in the year 1414 by the Mughal Emperor Ahmed Shah, although there are many conflicting narratives suggesting otherwise. Most of them are based on the religious disagreements. Some believe that the true foundation of the city dates back to the 11th century when it was called Karnavati and it was established by the Hindu king named Kanadev. As one must be familiar, History can never be completely accurate and is often biased by the lens of time, gender and culture. This brings us to the question, which narrative is more important? We believe the answer is both. It is important to acknowledge all the perspectives and narratives that a structure or a city has to offer, although that does not always go as peacefully as one might want. Ahmedabad is most often seen as the amalgamation of various cultures and religions and has managed to form a balance among the multitude of the religions that persist here, although the city has seen its fair share of religious disputes and riots. Every other decade, the city spectates the riots and madness influenced mostly by the religious or political powers, and the heritage of the city is often the collateral damage of these riots. First hand, seeing the impact of the conflict on my city, I couldn't help but wonder, do we ever learn from our mistakes? I believe that this is where the role of heritage comes in. Cultural heritage constitutes a powerful tool to foster dialogue, inclusion and implementation of people-centered approaches. Heritage conservation has the potential to reopen the conversations and bridge the gap that has been created by sheer lack of communication. It helps people come together and work as a community for the upliftment of the society. Heritage is something that is personal to the people. Be it the music that they listen to, the language that they speak, the food that they eat, 
oral traditions that are passed through generations or the festivals that they take part in with their neighbors and their families. This tradition provides continuity and consistency for people whose lives have been disturbed by change, conflict and calamity and may be carried on to the future. So, with this inspiring video, I open the floor to Kushi to explain a little bit more for us about the video, about the production, and the, the work she's having done. Yeah. Thank you, Kushi. Yeah. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Kushi Shah. I'm a conservation engineer currently working in India. Uh, this video has been made by me and one of my friends, Vivek Pamar. And I would like to thank uh, the culture, Climate, Culture and Peace Conference for giving us this platform to showcase this video. And I look forward to having a very interesting conversation over this with everyone. So, yeah. Thank you, Kushi. Uh, I would like to ask you a question. Uh, what, inspired, what inspired you to make this video? Um, about the inspiration of the video, I was recently volunteering for a conservation project in the uh, that is currently ongoing in the uh, old city of Ahmedabad. Uh, the project is about the restoration of a 150-year-old mosque, which resides in the old city of Ahmedabad, which has been abandoned almost a few decades back when uh, religious riots took place in the city back in the 80s. And at that time, all of the communities living around uh, the mosque left and hence people forgot that there uh, existed a mosque like this. And recently when we discovered the mosque, we realized that uh, currently it is uh, surrounded by the Hindu communities. So at first we were skeptical about how will the project go on. But uh, as the project went ahead, we realized that the community had played an integral part in helping us with the project. They had been there every step of the way, providing us with all the resources that they can helped us in procuring materials, cleaning the place, maintaining the place in our absence. And uh, this just inspired me and my friend Vivek that we realized that cultural heritage is the way to move beyond the conflict that uh, exists. And uh, yeah, that is what inspired us to make this video. That's so good. Well, uh, I think we have some connections with the Laura Jane Smith lecture. Uh, you mentioned that uh, we don't have uh, no, only history. We have many histories that we can we can say. And we also have Marcy here with us that is going to talk a lot about it with us and it's an uh, inspiration to us. Uh, Marcy, I don't know if you want to make some comments. Just Sorry, just quickly unmuting myself. Um, Kushi, that was a lovely video. Thank you so much. Um, lots of different thoughts coming to mind. I think first, I didn't have the chance to see Laura Jane Smith um, speech that uh, talk this morning um, because I'm in Washington, DC and it was just the timing was not right. But thinking through what I know of her work, um, who she just watching your video, I love you say like history is never completely accurate because it depends on the different perspectives that we're coming from. And I think one of the questions or one of the challenges that I've seen here in the United States often is who gets to decide who has the power to define that overarching narrative and say, ah, this is the one that will go on the plaque, or this is the one that will fund the restoration, or this is the one that will design the museum exhibit. So that was the first, um, as I was watching your video, that was really coming to mind was that who gets to decide. And I'm just curious, have have you encountered that? I'm sure you have, <laughs> but how you encounter that sense of power structure and who has the capacity to make those decisions? So that is actually a very interesting question. And coming from a country that has so much diversity, this is a question that is often brought up. I honestly, at this point, do not know to the answer to the question, but uh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's a very problem. <laughs> yeah. 
Uh, I think we have Jeremy with his hands up. Jeremy, please. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Um, actually, uh, Mar Mar Marcy and I in the same institution, we're both in DC, and I actually did get up to see Laura Jane's um, uh, keynote. And uh, yeah, three thirty in the morning is early over here, <laughs> but 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 it was great. Uh, you know, I think one of the things that resonates really strongly strongly with me um, with Laura Jane Smith's work and and what what uh, Cushy is saying is that um, heritage according to Laura Jane Smith and a lot of people in critical heritage studies, is about conflict. I mean, heritage, I mean, the authorized heritage discourse is in part defined by um, trying to create sort of an artificial consensus that the meanings and the values that people have for heritage, whatever this heritage is, is somehow homogenous. You know, Laura Jane specifically says, no, actually heritage is a result of conflict. So the question that I come in from, you know, I, I see lots of potential for using heritage to help resolve conflicts, to bring people together, but it also can help reinforce those kinds of conflicts. So I guess what I'm really curious about is, is there an example that you can think of, um, especially, you know, related to the city that you mentioned, where heritage was in a concrete way used to bring people together to resolve conflict? Um, those are the kinds of takeaways that I think are incredibly valuable. Yes, I completely agree that when used correctly, correctly, heritage can be used to pave way for a better future and inclusive future. But if we are not sensitive about it, it might create even more conflicts than we imagine. When we can imagine, uh, the a good example in my mind is the same that I mentioned, which inspired me to make this video in the first place that despite of the fact the, that there exists some tensions between the Hindu and Muslim community uh, in India, uh, this project that we are trying to work on, uh, the community in itself uh, does not really care that much about the religious aspects of it. And when you go to them and talk, them, talk to them, you realize that as an individual, people do not have conflict in their mind. In a larger spectrum, yes, but uh, when you are talking to a human, you do not constantly see the religion. And if we can find a, a way to talk to them and ask them why did the conflict, how did the conflict originated in the first place, and does it still affect us, then we can pave a way for a more inclusive future is what I think, yeah. Um. I, thank you so much, Kushi, for what you were saying. I just uh, added a quote from this morning uh, from Laura Jane about, uh, of course, she was saying many very interesting things, but just this quote about power. And then I would invite, of course, whoever wants to speak, maybe to comment on it or to ask other questions of Kushi. Uh, but the quote I wanted to pull out was, uh, she said, we must understand the power relations that we are engaging with what is at stake for whom? And we must really be aware of our own positions. And this was in relation to heritage, but it's, it's a very universal message, I think, as well. So if... Um, Together with you, up. Kelly, if I may. Of uh, course. I yes, I, I think you have another quote from Laura Jane Smith that connects with it. Uh, because we have some important... Uh, role in, in all of the construction of the Delta Right Heritage course. We are part of it uh, in some, some way. So she said that when, when she was presenting, we should be constantly asking, what are we doing and who are we doing it for? Who benefits and who is at disadvantage? Is it, impor it is important that we continue asking. I think that we have to keep this in mind when we're doing all of our work because uh, we can also, uh, we can also be part of the authorized heritage discourse. We can also be re, uh, we can also be uh, put this stronger than we thought. So I think that uh, it's a good question to be on our mind every time that we are working. And we have uh, uh, Tatenda with her hand raised. Yes, he's hand raised. Sorry, Tatenda. Thank you. Thank you, Please. Pedro. Um, well, first and foremost, I'd like to thank Krishi for this uh, wonderful presentation. 
And um, with me thanking you, I'm, I'm giving you this, maybe it's a challenge or it's a proposal, open one, where I'm saying um, it will be interesting to see you, you know, expanding such, such projects uh, to other parts of the world, for example, here in Africa, where, you know, there are a number of stories which uh, might come out uh, in as far as uh, heritage is concerned and, and conflict. So, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm giving you this as a proposal. Uh, if, if we can um, see what we can do, maybe to work together and, and see how we can um, produce something like this um, in areas such as maybe Zimbabwe, uh, South Africa, ETC in Africa. Now, um, another uh, point that I love that you raised is uh, related to heritage and conflict. And you raised that, you know, when you had to ask some people, they, you know, it, it, it was apparent that there was no conflict uh, among them, which, which brings me to this thought that uh, maybe based on what I've, I've observed from this side of the world, that you know, most of these uh, conflicts uh, which are related to heritage or heritage related conflicts, they're not conflicts that we are you know, much aware of, like the current generation, uh, which is actually uh, driving the, or fueling the, co the conflict is not actually aware of where the conflict is coming from. So it's just conflict because uh, my mother told me that these people are bad, but are they bad to you? No. Have they done anything bad to you? No, but it's just a statement which has resulted in uh, me believing that these people are, are, are bad. So what happens is uh, if we go and maybe try and again talk to them in the same manner that somebody talked to them and probably continue to publish, continue to write more, continue to produce uh, more videos like, like the ones that you have produced, continue to produce more documentaries which uh, communicate to them about, you know, the whole conflict uh, which, 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 which surrounds the whole heritage thing. So yeah, I, 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 I thank you for that uh, contribution that you have made, uh, Kushi, and I hope to, uh, you know, to work with you. Thank you. Thank you so much for your kind words. And yes, I would love to collaborate and make many more videos worldwide. I mean, collaborate with different countries. This was one of the things that we were hoping when I was having a talk yesterday with Kelly that maybe some more examples from different countries, different geographic areas would also come up in the conversation where they used cultural heritage as a tool to bridge the gap between certain communities or other conflicts. So, yeah. Yes, I think the what you're asking, Rai, is um, when we were talking yesterday about the theme of your video, and it's broadly about you know, culture bringing people together. And then I think we wanted to ask everyone even more broad question than that is, what do you think really brings people together? Is it culture? Is there something else as well that's from your own experience or from what you know is very powerful in bringing people together? And I open this to anyone who would like to answer. Well, maybe I'll start. Uh, from what I've seen uh, from this side of, of the world, basically Southern Africa, that's where I'm best. Um, to say uh, heritage or rather culture brings people together. Yes, it's, it's true. Culture does bring uh, people together. And um, again, it can um, actually, uh, what can I say? It can actually um, divide people. Like what is happening here in South, in South Africa, if, if, if you have uh, been watching the news, where people are only are fighting just because this person is, um, for example, a Shona, and the other person is in the valley. These are two different cultures. 
And because of that, they are fighting. And again, um, looking at that uh, whole scenario where you are seeing culture and heritage are uh, actually um, causing some uh, problems and troubles within the societies. It also, uh, it, it, it is also working as a tool which is actually bringing people together. That is if they are of the same culture. So can people of the same cu culture coexist? Yes. And they, are, they can be brought together by that same culture. But can people of different diverse cultures uh, unite? I think in that regard, culture becomes a dividing factor. And it's happening where people based on cultures, based on um, and culture, it, 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 it actually um, talks of a number of things. Uh, ranging from the language, the way we dress, whatever, and goes on and on. So um, in as much as we might want to say it's bringing people together, it's also dividing people. And I think uh, it is now high time where we start to uh, talk of cultural relativism, where we say all cultures are important, equally important, no culture is um, better than the other. And yeah, I think this that would be the starting point. Thank you for okay. making that distinction. Sorry, Ajao, I was talking over you. Go ahead. No, no, go on. Uh, so I just want to say thank you for making that distinction. It's uh, especially considering the topics we're discussing this week. It's, you know, about conflict and peace as well. And culture is not a neutral thing in that arena. And I see uh, that Jeremy had his hand raised and Marcy as well. So I'll give the floor to Jeremy first and uh, then to Marcy. Thank you. Thanks, Kelly. You know, building what Tatenda uh, said, um, thinking of an example here from the United States um, around like say Civil War monuments um, and how that heritage or heritages has both divided and brought people together. Um, you know, as a as a you know symbolic interaction between the object and, and what that intangible heritage creates, you have people in the United States who view a Civil War monument, uh, African American uh, population, for instance, many people who view that as a divisive thing. That it's something that um, is uh, representative of you know chattel slavery, but paradoxically it's actually brought a lot of people together and helped spur a lot of solidarity say around the Black Lives Matter movement because people have a shared heritage that is a reaction against a negative monument that's sending a negative message. Um, and so, I mean, certainly in, in the US where my practice is in, in research, um, I, I never see heritage manifest in a singular way. There's always seems to be multiple sides to it. It brings people together and it pushes them apart. And then the interesting thing to me is that question, um, for those of us who are engaged in the authorized heritage discords, we're experts in some way, right? We're facilitators, we're doing something. Um, how, how, what is our ability? Um, what is our moral and ethical obligation to understand what heritage is and, and utilize it, facilitate the process in a way that is beneficial for people, especially when you put that within a policy framework that really can tie your hands. Um, I certainly have no uh, answers for that, but I'm very curious what people think. Okay. Um, I think I'll follow that. Um, Jeremy, I wasn't sure which example you might pull from, um, but I will, I'll just briefly add to that, that the U.S. situation of Black Lives Matter, I think, has been such a powerful example here in the U.S. of really re-engaging with history. And something that has really impressed me is the extent to which many of the Black Lives Matter activists have said there is systemic racism now, but we cannot understand it without understanding how old it is and really bringing in the depth. And going back to 1619 is the year that the first uh, in Africans were enslaved, were brought to the U.S. and saying, you must go back that far to understand what we are experiencing now. And we cannot unpack everything, 
by only looking at the present. And so that's been a really fascinating nexus of modern day situation, but bringing in, in the history. Um, the example that occurred to me, uh, I'm in Washington, D.C., and I live very close to the U.S. Capitol building. And right now, there is a lot of engagement about what happened uh, last January 6th with the storming of the Capitol and the different, so it's a building, you know, a tangible thing, but there are so many meanings that are being placed on that building. And there are so many meanings being attached to what happened on that day and the different narratives of it. And for someone who works in history, in the heritage space, that literally every day I turn on my radio now and I hear really um, deep discussions about, well, what did the founding fathers of the U.S. intend with some of the documents that they set up? There's probably been that undercourse all along, but really there's so much going back to what were the people in 1776 and 1780 really wanting? What were they intending? And really trying to bring those threads forward. We don't have a consensus, but I feel like, oh my God, we are living in this space. Heritage isn't something out there it is literally right here and we're living and breathing it every day. And there's definitely a lot of conflict, but central uh, features around all of that. So just adding that as another example um, that, that goes, it feels like it goes with all of this. Thank you. I will let the discussion go, go in also to Mr. Tatenda, please. Okay. Um... Maybe Messi has actually um, reminded me of something. You know, here in Zimbabwe, uh, we have got the Great Zimbabwe. I'm not sure if uh, many of you are familiar of it. So we have got the Great Zimbabwe, right? Uh, in as much as uh, a lot of us uh, are proud of it to be, you know, the symbol of uh, our heritage and um regarding it as part of our heritage it's actually uh causing a lot of crazy divisions firstly from uh, a cultural perspective where different uh cultures within zimbabwe are claiming for example the ownership of 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 of, of that heritage which means there is there are fights over the ownership of heritage that's number one Number two, the fights over the meanings attached to that war structure and uh, everything which is which is within it. There are crazy fights. And another thing, from a political perspective, politicians are now using that same heritage structure to crush the opposition. And if, if, if you are to go again into the uh, liberation heritage, where uh, we are saying Zimbabwe got independence after, the, after a war occurred and uh, the country was liberated, here's what is happening. A certain section of the society is now associating themselves with uh, the liberators, while it's alienating the other group. So this is what, what is happening where heritage is now being in one way being personalized and in some cases being used as a tool to crush uh, people. And maybe my question to all of you is, uh, what do you think can be done in order to, you know, to ensure that instead of uh, people using heritage as a tool to uh, perpetuate hate, what can be done to use that same heritage as a tool to ensure that there is peace? Yes, uh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Tenda. Uh, someone wants Ferris, please. هل ممكن أن نشارك باللغة العربية وتسمعون الترجمة؟ آه 
النقطة التي أثيرت بأن التراث قد يكون سبب للصراعات وقد يكون مؤجج للصراعات <تصفيق> هذا حقيقة لا يمكن تجاوزها وكما ذكر الأخ أنه في كثير من السياسيين بيهتموا بإثارة المشاكل واستغلال التراث لتحقيق مكاسب سياسية النقطة الآن هي على الأشخاص الذين عاملين في مجال التراث هو البحث عن التراث الذي يدعو إلى السلام النقاط التي فيها التراث يعتبر مثار خلاف كل العاملين في مجال التراث والمهتمين عليهم العمل على تحييده بينما التراث الذي بيعمل على توحيد الصف وعلى نشر المحبة والسلام بين المواطنين وبين الشعوب المختلفة هذا الذي هو الذي أن نهتم فيه أن يظهر أن يكون محط اهتمام الجميع أن يتم تشجيعه بينما أي تراث بيسبب خلاف لابد من العمل على تحييده بشكل أو بآخر حتى يظل التراث رديف للسلام وليس رديف للصراعات والحروب هذه هي الفكرة شكرا لكم Thanks so much, Mr. Ferris. I I completely agree with what uh, he said, and I uh, I had written a small blog on the dark heritage of India as well, and that's a very important sub part of heritage. And I think as a, a fellow heritage enthusiast, it also becomes our own responsibility to uh, handle with care the conflict and the dark part associated with this heritage because there might be people out there who want to use it for their own personal agenda and that is when we have to take a step and try to neutralize the situation as much as we can well uh I open again the floor if we have some other questions, some other comments. Recording stopped. Recording in progress. We have someone called guest. I don't know who is. We don't have your name. I would like, I would like to ask Tatsenda if there are some good examples of heritage bring stability in the region of Africa. Well, <laughs> um, you know, yeah, there, there are some examples uh, where heritage has actually brought stability. But, you know, um, first and foremost, you will need to be um, a bit selective, like um, it's geographically best where you are saying people of the same uh, culture within the same geographical zone Obviously, they are being brought together by um, a certain uh, maybe cultural um, aspect or a certain uh, heritage site. Like, for example, um, in Zimbabwe, uh, there is an archaeological site which is uh, within a certain community and because of you know some uh, educational campaigns which have been done by the heritage pra practitioners the communities that are being brought together almost like on a yearly basis where the whole community is coming together they are celebrating they are celebrating their 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 heritage now the good thing about this is if i am uh, from a certain tribe and again, from a certain cultural uh, background, when I come into that area, you know, it, it will be now a matter of uh, whether I want to be part of these people or not. But in most cases where I've seen, uh, for example, the Shona people coexisting with the Ndebele people, at the end of the day, the Ndebele people will end up celebrating 
the heritage which is within the locality of, 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 of the Shona people, or rather within the locality of the area where they are resettled to. So yeah, there are some examples where, you know, heritage is actually bringing people together. But at the end of the day, uh, you know, heritage uh, only like, for example, heritage sites without any uh, tangible benefits to the people that is good as idle, that is good as silent. Now, what, what is making uh, some of these, you know, heritage sites uh, important in bringing people together is because of the different activities that have been, uh, you know, placed in order to celebrate that uh, the existence of such heritage within the communities. And another thing is, uh, I, I will not talk of the Great Zimbabwe because it's, it's, it's like a national site, which is also a world heritage site. And obviously a lot of people, they know about it. And because of its um, popularity, almost everyone wants to be associated with, 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 with the site. Uh, even if I am Shona, I am Debele, I would want to be associated with that site. And also I would start to say my ancestors, they are the ones who built this site. And the other one would be saying, my ancestors are the ones who built. So that's where conflict is coming from. But uh, in, in small sites, like sites within uh, small communities, yes, Yerkshig is actually bringing people together. And I think in such sites, because of those activities, those ceremonies, um, different cultures are being uh, brought together and different people are, you know, um, actually being given a chance to uh, showcase their cultures. So yeah, there, there are some examples, but you know, they are not that much, but they are. Thank you so much, Mr. Jatenda. I would like to ask uh, Afara to make some comments, some uh, final comments, some closing comments, please, Afara, of the day. Well, I was not expecting to be uh, called because I have no voice. <laughs> and, oh, I'm uh, so sorry, Afara. Sorry. Just a small <laughs> some sentence. Sorry. Um, no, could could uh, somebody else take up for me? Marcy, would you do the honors? I'm so sorry. No voice left. <clears throat> I'm so sorry, Afana. Sorry, sorry. It's, I, it's not your fault. But I would just like to say that uh, I'm, uh, looking, uh, I was very keenly listening to that in the, <clears throat> if I'm pronouncing your name well. Uh, and I would say that um, with such a vast continent, uh, it's not first of all ask you to speak for all of Africa, but uh, <clears throat> indeed, uh, Sometimes I think uh, if we um, really um, associate heritage too much with a place uh, rather than uh, people, it can be a cause of uh, conflict. Um, as, as we uh, also tried to, uh, we heard from Professor <clears throat> Laura Jane Smith this morning uh, that sometimes like we tend to reduce heritage to places and, and I think that's where the problem begins. And that's when, uh, you know, uh, the idea of ownership, identity, laying claims, uh, when you, to some extent, commoditize heritage, that's when the problem starts. Rather from a feeling to something to be owned, that's when, you know, it starts becoming a point of conflict between people. That's that's what I think, uh, and that's my takeaway from the day. But that's my opinion. Yeah. Thank you so but much, Aparna. Marcy, and, would uh, <laughs> yes, please, Marcy, if you want to say some sentence, and then I think we can start closing the session. Thank you, Aparna. Your voice just did very well, so thank you for bringing that in. And I <laughs> um, and I apologize, to everyone. I wish I had more. Um, to pull in from Laura Jane Smith's work and maybe if Jeremy is still in line, if he has a, a piece to add, because I know he said he did have a chance to watch it. 
something that I will add, um, I'm trained as an archaeologist and the and one of the fundamentals of archaeology is we, we start with stuff. It's about the things that we find. And one of the positions I think archaeology has often been looked to for or pushed into with respect to climate change is the sense of, oh, we can learn from the past or that there will be things from the past that will tell us what to do. And a, something I have come to, a realization I've come to is the past actually can never tell us exactly what to do. We can look to it for information. We can look to it for inspiration, but what happens now into the future is our own decision. And so if we have um, actually a former grad student uh, faculty of mine would always say, we always learn more about ourselves through the study of the past than we actually do about the past. And I remember at the time being a bit grumpy with him, like, no, I'm here to learn about the past. I want to become an archaeologist. But the farther I've gone on, that sense of trying to understand what questions are we asking of the past? Why do we want to know? Again, thinking of climate change, if we're looking for sustainability or answers, how are we phrasing that question? And how can we find sustainability in the past if we can't visualize what it is now in the present? So that ability to say, what does the past inspire in us? What do we think about? But ultimately it's come down to what do we want now? It, we, ha we have a starting position, but where do we want to go? And that is our own decision. It will not make that decision for us. So I think that's sort of a space that I'm, I'm at right now. Um, but I will add that, that it's our own questions and what we do with it. And, and if I may add to that, um, um, the space that I, this day that I have, uh, you know, gathered from being in different discussions is also that <clears throat> if we are looking at uh, connections between heritage and um, uh, climate change and climate crisis, then we also have to look at it, uh, heritage as a process, just as um, uh, climate change uh, is a process. And it's not something the carbon in the air now or in the atmosphere now, but it's something that has been building up to, to that amount of carbon. And it, it's a process. Similarly, heritage and making of heritage is a process. And somewhere they have intersected. And it's these intersections that we have to understand and processes. And again, as I said, uh, trying to, it's very difficult. It's very difficult because all the time we are, you know, um, rooted our practices firmly rooted in the physical and the material objects or the material aspect of heritage, but uh, to make it understand as a process of making where we are constantly negotiating, you know, a future or a present or, you know, trying to deal or claim, lay claim to certain things in the present. So it's, uh, it's very difficult to, to move our, uh, you know, gaze and to understand heritage in that sense. And then how do you convince others who are non-heritage uh, uh, professionals or who are not working in the heritage sector to then take heritage uh, as a process, uh, just as development is a process and, you know, so, yeah, to consider it as a process. Thank you so much, Aparna and Marcy for those sentences to us. I think that uh, it's one of the main focus that we're discussing here. We are looking for the future also. We are not looking just for the past. We are looking how we can, together with the uh, what we have from now, with all the information, all the heritage that are given to us, what we can do for now. Because we are seeing that uh, the climate crisis is here. Uh, we have facing some crisis in heritage also. So we have to look forward and have to look how we can change, how we can move. So I... There is a, there is a, um, I see Jeremy. Uh, yes, Jeremy it? says, yes, please, Jeremy. Uh, real quick here, kind of build on what, what uh, Marcy had asked, but I, I think uh, a part of, one of the things that's really important that you mentioned here is related to what heritage is and how it's defined and who gets to define it. And that's one of those things that was not really brought up in this particular discussion related to what Laura Jane Smith brought up. But if you remember, for those of us, we saw the presentation earlier today, um, she was very specific to say how uh, the, the lay person 
the definition of heritage was very different from what is an authorized heritage discourse, what we learn in school and what we practice as professionals. For a layperson, more often than not, heritage is going to be defined as an emotional connection with, with something. It can be an object, it can be with a, a, a social relationship, a network. Um, and it, it, it's, I just offer the idea, I'm not, I mean, this is Laura Jane Smith's work, but that idea of process, focusing on process, we really need to, as professionals, pay attention to what this looks like from a grassroots bottom-up perspective of that, the layperson's perspective, what that yeah. definition is, and be careful about imposing our definitions. Because I think it's kind of remarkable. We've been using this word heritage in this whole conversation this afternoon um, without actually defining what we're talking about. And it, yeah. it, it, I think it's very fascinating, but... That's, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And it's every now and then we slip back into mode. It's it's so difficult. We're coded to think of it. Yeah, I, I totally, this, we have to see it from bottom up. And as you said, like, is it a feeling then? Then why am I commoditizing it? Or, yeah. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you for that insight. Very valuable. Yeah. Thank you so much. So with this, I think we can close the day. And uh, the climate open mic, I think it's closed. And also the our second day of our conference. We hope to see you all tomorrow. I think uh, it has been a great opportunity to share knowledge, to share experience, and to uh, have it together all the people that are interested and they have some points to share with us. So thank you so much. And uh, we'll see you tomorrow. Thank you. Well. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Recording stopped. Ah, Alessia. Yeah. <laughs> this is a mask. We should also wear a mask.